Now, as you can see, the title of our talk here, Trying to Make Forensic Processing Easier, hat tip to Phil for coming up with the, the title. So, uh, I'm Aaron, that's Troy, let's get started. My part of the talk is, well, how did, how did, I, how did we get here as far as my tools or just my design philosophy in general? So, uh, different points on the screen I'll kind of unpack as we go, but there's lots of reasons why you might want to write tools. One is just to keep them open source, and there's lots of advantages to that. One is that we can separate basically the front end that you use from the actual implementation of what does the work. Now, most people are going to want to use the front end, either the command line, or the graphical user interface, but there's some cases where somebody might want to take advantage of just the underlying code that does the work to ingest it into a bigger pipeline. And you don't want to be coupled to a GUI, you don't want to be coupled to uh, a, a command line tool because the command line tool may not work the way that you want. And so by separating kind of the logic of the heavy lifting with the more human accessible front end, we gain that advantage. And the other advantage is it's open source and all my stuff's on GitHub. You can just go take a copy of that code and make it do, what it with, do with whatever you want. Because sometimes there may be additional fields that I give or things that I don't and that's going to be stuff that isn't necessarily useful to you and if a forensic tool isn't useful, why do you want to use it? We want to make these tools as flexible and as, as easy to use as possible. So, uh, and, and then the other part of being open source is just, it can be validated. It's not a black box. And so if you have other people who either write tools or know the artifacts, they can take the output and match it up with what they're expecting to see from a, a low level understanding of those data structures, which is going to be a very important skill to have is to understand what the data looks like and how it operates, and we'll see that uh, going into some of the next stuff here in a bit. Uh, the other, the second part here is basically we want to not rely on APIs. APIs are good, uh, Windows has tons of APIs built in, but you have to balance the speed that you can leverage with an API to the possibility that you might not get all the data exposed, uh, you might, might be able to get lied to depending on what's running on your computer, and so by looking at the data in its raw form, the MFT or a registry hive or whatever, we can verify that we're actually seeing all the data that actually exists there. And so getting into things like deleted file recovery, deleted registry key and value recovery, the API is not going to do that for you. And so you almost have to go into a lower level kind of a parsing mode to be able to recover those things and then take advantage of them. Uh, and that, that's really the second point there is you're not always going, if the API doesn't expose some functionality, it's not going to be available. Uh, and in many cases, we don't even want to rely on the functions that the API give us because we're looking at things slightly different. Microsoft's implementation of a particular feature is certainly not how we as forensics people are going to necessarily leverage it. It's deallocated uh, <laughs> information that's particularly important and okay. unaccessible with APIs. Yeah, and anything like that that's basically dropped, the API doesn't care about it at that point. It, it doesn't exist as far as they're concerned. But in our world, that's gold. And that's really where a lot of the, the very useful conclusions can be drawn uh, from that. And then finally, the last point is, well, we can make things better. What's best for the community? And obviously, we can't make everything, every, a tool for everything for everybody. Um, but we can try and pull in suggestions and ideas and get feedback and make fixes. Again, other people can contribute fixes. Um, and so it becomes very useful. And then finally, the last point somewhat touches on one of the things I said earlier. You as a developer, or any developer, or internal or external to a company, can take that code, leverage it, and then improve your process or extend it, hopefully sharing back with, with everybody else uh, so that everybody gets the advantage there. Now, for me, as far as how I go about designing things, this is kind of the my thought process, and it goes from the most important stuff at the top down to the, it's important, sure, but it's less important than the stuff above it. And so this one you look at and you say, well, it seems like processing the data accurately should be the most important thing. And it certainly is, right? We want to make sure that the data that we have is parsed correctly. But what I'm saying here is that if you don't take all of the data in, you don't have a chance to parse it correctly because you're not looking at it. And so what I'm saying here is, if you look at a data structure and you see, oh, there's a Unicode string, or that looks like it's a, a timestamp, well, don't just focus on those things that, you, that are relatively quick to extract. There's all kind of other stuff in there that could be just as or more useful that we just have to figure out. Uh, and so, like, for example, all of the stuff related to shell bags that have kind of come out over the last years, 
Uh, that was a, a project that started after Dan Pelega's talk at the summit uh, and has just grown into research and people looking at this stuff differently. There's so much data in there. We can't just focus, oh, there's, there's a GUID right at the front. Well, there's also 15 other shell bags after it and we want to interpret all that data. And so then it falls down. Once we know how to parse the data, we have the data, we parse it accurately, well then we can optimize for speed or whatever we want to do and then design the tool so that it can operate at scale, which is the stuff that, that Troy's primarily going to be interested in. Now, my philosophy when it comes to designing tools is I don't, you can see them up here, I want to make sure that you know when you have a problem. To me, that's one of the most important things. It, I never want to disguise an error or minimize an error or make it seem like everything's fine when something went sideways. We want to allow for some type of graceful progression and so that you could use the data, but we don't want to just smooth it over or pretend it didn't happen because as artifacts change, and this is another thing that, uh, that, that Troy's very helpful with, with uh, as things change over time, you get things like how many times has AM cache changed in the last two years? At least twice, two or three times. They've taken things, they've, they've given things in replace of what they've taken and so on. So we have to, as at least people that are designing and doing the research on these things, we have to go in and look at these structures, see if our parsers work, see if they don't. But they're designed to only extract out stuff that they know and kind of work around or just ignore things that we don't know about, we have the potential to data. When Windows 10 jump list changed and a, an additional four bytes just showed up in one of the releases, it broke pretty much every jump list tool that was out there. Some worked, uh, some crashed horribly. And when I say worked, it looked like they worked, but you're missing data. And so that goes back to that trust but verify, and you, you're able to do that better if you understand the underlying data is there. Is, is a jump list for Word, and Word has been heavily used on your system? Well, you should have more than one shortcut there. There should be a lot of data there that your tools should be spitting out. And if you looked at it in a hex editor and you saw all these, this data, that would give you some indication that you have a mismatch between what your tool's doing and what reality is. And so failing early, making it obvious that you have a problem, uh, either auto-reporting the error with user consent or something to give feedback to allow these things to be fixed, all goes a long way. Shellbags Explorer is a great example of that. People, you, the users, find new things all the time. There's no way that I could find every single GUID and all these extra edge cases and so as people use the tool, they see these things, I don't know what to do with this squid, or this shell bag's not understood, this data type is not understood, and you submit that back, and we can then improve the tool for everybody. And so all of those things go a long way into the design principles to make these tools what they are. Uh, just an example of some of the tools, I'm not gonna go through all of them, these are more of the command line focused tools, again, revolving around the category of things. Um, there's so many forensic artifacts, and it becomes very difficult even for seasoned people to name all these different e evidence of execution artifacts and stay current with them. No, I, I brought oh, a we helper. Got, we got a yeah. prop for that. So if we, if you look at this, even senior people, maybe they could name 80% of the artifacts, but if your key evidence is in the 20% that you didn't know about or you didn't remember, you could potentially miss it. And so one of the things that I like to do when I, or otherwise, is tell people, focus on the category that helps you answer the question you're interested in. Do you want to know what ran? Do you want to know what was open? And so on. And so if we think categorically like that, we can leverage the ability to group common parsers around different types of artifacts, evidence of execution, prefetch, AM cache, shim cache, and so on. All of those things would end up in program execution, for example. And now you have the advantage of everything goes in one place from an analytical perspective, and less senior people also can go in there. I didn't even know that that existed there's the actual piece of malware that I'm looking for or whatever the problem is that you're trying to solve. And so we have all of these tools and these are just my tools. Now, when I go through and design a tool, I try to keep the options relatively the same because it just makes for an easier experience for the end user. Same options, same switches, uh, same different types of input and output, CSV and so forth. And, and, but even with my tools, there's a lot of different options in some of them, it becomes easy to not get the switch name right, or get a single dash, and so on. Not to mention all the other tools that exist out there that might have completely different options, completely different rules as to how you feed data, get data out, and so on. And so how do you know whether you're getting it right all the time and you didn't forget something? It becomes a very tedious, manual, labor-intensive process. 
And so we have to have a way to try and fix that, which is what we're driving to here. Uh, the other part is just different tools are going to output data differently. Different layouts in the CSV files themselves, which is always going to be a problem, uh, just because of the nature of the artifacts themselves. But that's where we have the ability to group things categorically that starts to help solve that problem to a degree. Uh, and then finally, at the end, maybe you forget an option. Maybe you didn't export the option the way you, you would normally do. Or you have a, a pipeline that you, you're designing that does things in a certain way. Well, if you're building your processing where you have to do things manually up front and you forget something, it could affect everything else after it. And so it becomes a problem of consistency, certainly as a scale. How do you go about do woo, doing the same thing over and over and over, not on one machine or 10 or 100, but at the scale that Troy has to deal with? We want these things to be automated and consistent and auditable and so on. And so that's some of the, the requirements for how do we solve this problem of having all of these disparate tools. And so we want to have a way to coordinate what we want, where's the data, what, how do I want to grab it, how do I want to organize it, represent it, and keep track of what I pulled. It has to be, we have to be able to automate it so that I can do this at scale across a wide range of machines. And then you just ha add more resources when you want to do that at scale to be able to continue to pull in more data from more and more machines depending on what your environment looks like. And so that's what our requirements are to try and build something that looks like that. And my solution for that is a tool that we released uh, in February this year called CAPE. Uh, now CAPE, th there's certainly not going to be the, the one solution for everybody all the time. Don't look anywhere else. I'm not saying that. But this goes a long way for you to build these, what I call a tool chain, this processing pipeline that's going to allow you to automate certain key steps of your forensic process. If you look at the same data all the time, whether you have an E01 or you do live response, well, let's, let's set that up in such a way that I don't have to manually collect and then manually run a bunch of programs and then go look at the output. We can build that chain and then run that chain using two very simple things, a target and a, a module that does everything that you would normally do manually all the time the same exact way over and over and over. And so that's really what we're, we're talking about here, search whatever you want, F response, and mounted E01, a UNC share, a VHD, whatever. Collect the data that you want, keeping track of what you've collected, keeping track of all the metadata, reapplying the metadata, and potentially putting that, those files and directories that you've copied into a container that can serve as original evidence. It's not an E01, but it's a, it's a copy of everything you've extracted out that you can then use from that point forward. You do a data reduction at that point, I don't have to then do some more filtering down the line if I were to do super timelines or whatever. We, we do the kind of the heavy lifting and the sorting up front and we have to worry about less downstream. And then finally we want to process the data that we collect. This is where I actually take the registry hives and jump lists and link files and parse them out and turn them into something that a human being, an analyst, would want to go through and take and start making some conclusions about. And so CAPE is going to allow us to do that uh, because of the way it was designed. Now, CAPE by itself doesn't really do anything. All it's going to do is give you a means, you a means, to collect things and run programs. Now, myself and people at SANS, and certainly the community has done, I think at this point, they've given more modules and targets than I've written myself back into for the community. It provides a way for us to automate pulling registry hives, pulling the file system metadata, pulling link files and jump lists, pulling all the evidence of execution artifacts. If you've ever heard about a file on a file system, you can target it with, with CAPE. And if it's not already built in, it would take probably five minutes to do. And then you have that from that point forward, it's always going to work exactly the same. So that's really where it's customizable, it's flexible to your needs. You don't have to call me or ask me, hey, can you make it do this? If you, want, if you know where it lives, from Outlook to Word to whatever you want, you can go in and target that stuff. And that's really the middle piece there. Uh, and both of those things are going to come into play when it comes to building these consistent processing tool chains, which, which is the next thing. And it's kind of building the bridge over to what we're going to hear Troy talk about here in a moment. And so CAPE then becomes the glue that we can use to build these processes that collect and then process to give us our output every single time. If you have certain types of cases that you work, and you're like, well, I know I want event logs and this and this and this, make a target that just pulls those files. Now, that doesn't mean you can't go back and pull something else if you need it, but 
I've had this conversation with Dave and some other people. If you start with everything, where, how do you know where to start? There's so much data to just say, give me everything and I'll wait and I'll wade through four gig CSV. Start with what you know and then add things on, build things onto that. You're going to have a much easier time wading through all of the various data that's on these systems to start telling the story that you need to tell. <clears throat> and so, well, I said tool chain, but what is that? It's basically a set of targets. Targets collect data and modules, modules run processes that are grouped together to meet a certain investigative need. And you can see some of the bullet points there for the, the goals that we want to have. It's got to collect everything. It's got to be thorough. We want to be able to have that process be repeatable. I don't want it to work well one time and then forget three files the next time. It's got to be consistent. We want to have a means to do it at a scalable level, which is going to solve some of the problems with collecting from a wide range of places. And then obviously, what will actually did. What did it pull? What were the dates? What is the hash values? Can we verify it? And so, how do you build these tool chains? Well, I, I came up with this little think DFIR thing. So, determine, fabricate, invoke, review, right? So, makes it easy to remember. But determine what to collect. I got to know what files that you want to actually pull. This certainly goes back to, well, what kind of an investigation are you running? Uh, and that, that's going to lead you down the road to certain artifacts will be more valuable than others. And then you build, you fabricate the targets and modules that are going to meet that need. You run them with tape. That's actually going to pull and process stuff. Um, and then once that's done, you actually have your, your analytical work that you can load into Timeline Explorer or push into Splunk or SoftElk or whatever other system that you want to start doing data stacking or looking for outliers and things like that. Okay? And so that's really the, the steps that have gone into designing the, the overall package of my software and how I've glued them all together. Now, before I switch over and hand this over to Troy, I want to just say or talk a moment about uh, where my tools are going to be going here. I've had plenty of requests over the years for cross-platform capabilities. Can your tool run on Linux? Can, will it run on a Mac? And so on and so forth. Now, while I'm a firm believer in that you should do Apple or you should do Apple forensics on an, on an Apple machine, you should do Windows forensics on a Windows machine. I understand that different places have different needs. With that said, with Microsoft's advances in .NET and how they've moved to .NET Core at going forward, cross-platform is becoming much closer to a reality, at least for the, the work that I'm doing. And so with the exception of the GUIs, Registry Explorer, Shellbags Explorer, those are win forms and they probably won't ever work on Linux or, or Mac, for example. Um, almost all the other command line tools and parsers will be .NET Core compliant probably by the end of the year. That's my goal. Some of them already are, uh, which means you're going to be able to download the stuff with .NET Core in place on a, on, a, on a Mac or a Linux machine, and it will work exactly the same as it runs on a Windows box. My hesitancy to do that in the past has been because I don't want to give you 3,800 DLLs and an executable you have to try. I want to make it easy. And so it's getting to the point with this new release where that's actually going to be uh, possible. So look out for that, and I'll, of course, I'll keep everybody up to date on Twitter and my webpage uh, as we go forward with that. So with that said, I want to turn over the rest of the time to Troy to talk about not just the theory of how we de develop tools and, and all these great uh, functionality and capabilities, but how, do, how does that actually look like in the real world and at a significant scale? So with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, sir. You got it. So I'm going to talk about forensics. This is my go-to slide for forensics. A lot of people come into forensics, they see the fancy tools, and that you know forensics people are kind of like IT heroes, and they just assume there's glory. This is your reality. I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I'm going to talk about automating digital forensics for compromise investigations and doing it at scale. And we throw all these terms out, so a little bit of definition. By scale, I mean the ability to do a repeated type of action as much as you need to to get the job done. So I'm going to be looking at two projects that we do um, in, in Microsoft to just kind of show you different ideas of scale and what you can do with these tools. Um, before I dig in, I want to talk a bit about the weird environment I work in. It may be very different from the ones you are working in. Um, my primary target is the IaaS VM. That's uh, Infrastructure as a Service VM. That's the one that, as a customer, you own. Um, a VM is a virtual machine. Uh, like any other machine, it has some hard drives. Um, the thing about IaaS VMs in Azure, and probably the same with many other clouds, is that they persist these virtual hard drives in the cloud in storage. It 
in Azure, it's page blob storage. That's important. I won't be able to go into it, but people want to talk Azure and forensics, I'm, I'll be here today and tomorrow. One of the very cool things about this, though, is storage has been optimized to be very, very fast. And one of the things storage does is replicate data very, very fast. Um, you snapshot blobs. Well, hard drives are blobs in storage, and we can snapshot those. So the unique thing about my environment is that my evidence acquisition, my getting myself a forensics copy of a drive, takes less than a minute. I click it. There, I've got a copy. The VM is not touched. The VM is not impacted. Bad guys can be on it whatever, they have no idea this has happened. And what I end up with is a complete disk image. It's captured at a point of time, leaving the file system intact and consistent. Um, it's just like you, you got a picture of a drive at that second. Um, this all can be done through scripting or code calling the REST APIs or whatever. So it um, can be automated and it's highly scalable. Uh, on our team, uh, one of my coworkers, Fed, is over there. She's responsible for our pipeline. This, it does this at about 10,000 VHDs at a time as we go through all of the first party ISVMs uh, at Microsoft. Um, so, because we have this very quick way of capturing disk images, we come up with a very simple, well, simple to make a diagram of <laughs> uh, project of, of forensic automation. Snapshot the OS VHD. We, um, oh, one other thing, you do not have to copy the VHD down to wherever you're going to work on it. It's in page blob storage, and for reasons I can discuss later, um, you can read it like a drive, remotely. Anyway, we'll snapshot the drives, we send it to various processing VMs, depending on which uh, pipeline, which uh, service or whatever it's going through. Uh, it'll go through a period of extraction, parsing some of the extracted files, it may do some uh, file scanning, and then, very important for us, Outputs the results of structured data. Could be XML, JSON, CSV, TSV. I like it if it's both human and machine readable. The idea is that we get something that we can throw into a variety of tools and analytics. The first one I want to talk about is what's called our forensic pipeline. It predates my involvement on the team, um, predates CAPE. It does use some of Eric's tools. It uses some of our internal tools, and there's a whole lot of um, Azure orchestration that goes on the back, so that keeps a lot of our devs uh, working um, and um, lose hair over and stuff like that. It's, it's, uh, but it's designed to be a, a very large-scale uh, threaded telemetry. It's um, sort of a lightweight forensic scan, and it's very useful for us for detection and hunting. But the way it works is it will um, we, uh, we'll go through all the first-party VMs. It could be anywhere from uh, 100,000 to 300,000 and I think we take them about 10,000 at a time. We run this globally, so you know we've got 54 data centers now, so this starts going through them all. Um, and we're pulling out artifacts related to the file system, some information out of the registry, ASAT, uh, auto runs and things like that. Uh, telemetry, that would be the AMCache file. Um, look at select events and go through. Uh, and then uh, based on files that have surfaced through an, this analysis, it will then automatically do some file scanning. So. Uh, it does all this process. It outputs um, all kinds of stuff. We have it going into various places in Azure where we can do things to it manually, uh, a lot of automated stuff, and, um, and then sort of a hybrid of it. So what we end up getting is um, automatic alerting on any suspicious executables uh, if they uh, ring our antivirus in any way. Um, but we also look at code signatures and um, uh, hashes and the like. Um, it'll also spit out ASEPs. We see ASEPs up there. That's a Microsoft term for auto start extensibility point, which you know as auto runs, but it fits. It's a lot easier for me to type, um, just four letters, and I can spell it most of the time. So, you know, we get just, it's, it's not a whole lot of information from a forensic standpoint, but it's a lot of information when you're doing it at uh, 100 to 300,000 VMs at a time. Uh, so we get automatic uh, alerts. Um, popping on some of these, some of this goes into a tool where the data then gets secondary analysis. So my coworker Sveta has written some machine language uh, uh, program to go through the data and also find out other things that we're not getting through the simpler scans. And then there's the manual review, which often falls to me or my manager, which does seem fair. Um, <laughs> then we go through and we will uh, look at sort of these collations of data and pick out additional things that look suspicious. Um, 
it's quite effective, um, and we're building in, um, adding in uh, some of the new registry stuff, so I do the, the batch files. He does the hard programming, I write the batch files, and now we'll get it, more information. But in addition to all this stuff, uh, especially with the, some of the new stuff we're adding in, um, something we've been working on for a period of time is that now we can do this differencing of VHDs in time. So we take a VHD from one VM, uh, you know, a VM at one point in time, we look at the same uh, VHD, or I should say the same VM, it's OS VHD at a later time, and you can start differencing on various registry settings, uh, telemetry settings, or files. And uh, this actually turns out to work pretty well, but um, uh, it's, it's something we're working on to improve because obviously there's also a lot of noise that goes on between uh, uh, different states and time. You can also do this, and this is a very cool thing about the cloud. The cloud likes to repeat instances. You've got a VM that acts as a web front. You need 100 VMs that act as your web front. They're all doing the same things. They're running the same image. They're running basically according to the same script, the same sort of automation. So you can actually difference them between uh, the VMs that are all uh, instances of the same sort of service. So it's a very cool thing. Now, um, I had this epiphany uh, a couple years ago. If you don't difference, but instead start counting and doing frequency analysis or distribution analysis, um, you can uh, take this uh, mass scale of gathering this data through things like the registry parser, the mcache parser, and the like, uh, and begin to see what's really going on um, at, in, at, in the wild at large. And uh, this, my epiphany was scale defines normal. Now, why is that important? See, you got to Hold that one up for you. Oh, there I. You go, there you go. <laughs> to find the bad, you need to know what is normal. W knowing what norm normal is in Windows has never been an easy job, and it's gotten harder with the cadence and the development cycles now with Windows. They're always throwing new stuff. So, by uh, taking this data that we have, putting it large, start doing counts and stuff, we know of the, say, uh, if you use uh, the batch file I've written for some of the ASAP stuff that's available and the, the, uh, the registry parser that he has, uh, that Eric's put up on his, his GitHub, I, I guess it comes, it's downloaded. Yep. Um, the ASAP collection looks up to, say, the class's roots. It's looking at all the com objects and stuff. And that'll average, you know, it could be 10,000 to 40,000 reg keys that you'll get for a given system. By gathering the stuff at large, we begin to see what's normal. and begins to give us, now we can start differencing uh, VMs against normal, against what's happening everywhere. If, if you look at 100,000 machines and they're all doing this, or they all have this command line, or they all have this registry key, that registry key is probably good. The second project, it's a um, triage forensics. Uh, it's, it goes to a much deeper level. It's going to grind away to draw, uh, drive. This is actually my third um, go around. It's like third iteration of this. Uh, my first one, um, well, several years ago, I gave a talk at Blue Hat, it's a Microsoft sponsored event for security. And I mentioned, I, I just, my whole presentation was on yes, we could automate certain forensics. And that was designed for very specific machines in Azure, the PaaS machine platform as a service, how they operate. And I was actually thinking more in terms of the actual Microsoft services that run on them. So I built this presentation, this whole idea about how we could automate it and do very fast, very thorough uh, forensics. And of course, Anyone who works in a large institution knows how this goes. Uh, my boss said, I like it, we're gonna do it, but I need it to work for all VMs, which completely changed it. So the first iteration was ACAP, Automated Compromise Assessment Platform. Uh, and at that point, I've stopped naming things. I had no idea what to call this, but because of uh, Rob's helpful hints on naming our presentation, I thought I could call it Troy's Easy Triage. <laughs> um, the idea is I've got a sort of a combination of CAPE and PowerShell orchestrating a, a tool chain that um, uh, we can use for um, triage. So what do I mean by that? Well, the previous platform is very good for um, detections and for hunting. With the da data repository from those scans, we can go back in and go, did we find anything that matched this hash? Or did we find any file like this? Uh, this is designed for after you get alerts, we want to run VHDs through this so that it will grind away and pick out the anomaly. So here, I'm not interested where the, where the uh, first pipeline is looking for things that we know are bad or suspicious things. This thing's looking for what you don't know up ahead of time it's going to be. So it's looking for anomalies, the weird stuff. Finds bad stuff, well, that's great too, but we're just trying to pick out the things that, that suggest something is there that should not be there but for the compromise. That's like a triple negative. <laughs> but um, uh, 
anyway, we're looking for things that um, will be helpful to either an analyst looking at it or one that our automated analytics can start picking out and running with. So uh, its target is uh, sort of twofold right now. So VHDs go through, and I want the output to be accessible to our SOC teams so they can start looking and, and doing their work on it, and that the data should also be accessible to the machine learning and stuff that Sveta is working on uh, so that we can uh, kind of kill two, two birds with one stone. Yeah, that's it. Uh, not one stone with two birds. <laughs> That's harder, actually. Um, I mean, if you want a sense of achievement. Um, but the idea also with working closely with our SOC analysts is to keep me grounded in reality, which you're probably beginning to think that is more important than some people might have thought. But um, this, the SOC people are constantly seeing what is ever the current threats, the, the, you know, the, what, what's going on, what are, what's really bothering the, the cases they need to work on. So it, it, we have a lot of back and forth with our SOC teams to, to um, help shape and, and our thinking on this. Um, so the basis of this is it's just doing uh, more parsing, more extracting, uh, more scanning and the like. Um, I want to be able to like scan every file on the disk and stuff. So whatever goes to the SOC or goes to analytics, we have a really robust data set to begin doing work on. Any questions? Nothing lets you know how dirty your glasses are than looking straight into a couple of lights. There's my thumb, <laughs> I think. Uh, so, now you're, um, if you're like me, and I know I am, okay, that's Ian, Ian's joke. Um, he's one of my coworkers. I have to give him credit, but that's one of the best jokes I ever heard in a presentation. But anyway, <laughs> the question is, I'm just going to say, if you're like me, you wonder, why would Microsoft be using these third-party tools? Why are we relying on some guy at Kroll? We have, you know, some developers at Microsoft. Why aren't we building these? And this is my shout-out to Eric. Building good tools is actually hard. You're not looking at the API. You're not just going to pick up the, the TechNet articles or the docs or whatever and start going, OK, yeah, I'll, I'll build that. You know, you're not connecting the API. You actually have to study the underlying uh, uh, data structures and like and understand it. Um, so it's not actually just a matter of getting the tool, getting it done, getting it out, testing it, having it work, having it be accurate. Um, but there's a um, maintaining it, keeping it up to date. So I've got some really good internal tools for doing, say, app compat cache. They're better than anything that's out there. They parse every single byte in it because people can look at the source code and they get everything. We also have stuff to do the objects.data database used by w WMI. Um, trouble is, that was done by a developer a few years ago. He's moved on to Office. They don't work anymore. Um, no one knows where the source code is. And that's just not a Microsoft thing. That's a forensics thing. How many good tools are out there that, like, the guy wrote them several years ago, they're gone, and it'd be great if someone kept them up to date. Um, this guy is writing good stuff. It's accurate. It gets me what I want. And it's maintained. It's updated. I think we're sitting in a window of opportunity here that, um, I, well, thank you much. I appreciate these tools. <laughs> this, this is um, quite a gift we have. But the reason I'm using uh, a lot of Eric's tools and some other third-party stuff is because they are accurate, and they are giving me the stuff I want as a forensics person. I'm not an IT. I'm not doing this for IT. I'm not doing this for programming. I'm doing this for forensics, and these tools are designed for forensics to give me the, uh, the, uh, the information I want. The other side is they are extensible and customizable. So for the easy triage that I've been working on, um, I have 85 uh, unique modules, 25 uh, batch files, and 25 uh, targets that all float over on addition to what ships. Uh, the reason is some of these are just little variations on the stuff that ships with CAPE. Some are uh, tailored specifically to do something internal, but it's very extensible. I can change file names. I can have them write to different places. I can control a lot about how they work. As a consequence, this gives me a great deal of flexibility. Finally, all of them output in a way, um, they output in two ways that are very important to me. The first is structured data again. I mean, text files are great. You can read them. But text files don't go into machines to get parsed. Text files are actually kind of a chore to read. You know, where's the data in it and how do you compare it? I want it in CSVs, TSVs, JSON, whatever, so we can push the tools and give stuff that analysts can work with. The second way the outputs are important to me is um, Eric has built in a lot of auditing and debug options. And now when I'm running this thing, we may run it you know, once, twice, 10 times, 20 times, 100 times, and it's all running in a way that no one's sitting there watching it. I won't know if something's not happening. 
Um, I like to be able to go into the audit logs and be able to see, you know, things work. Oh, why is that file not there? Oh, that file really wasn't there on disk. Or, as often happens with the development cadence of, of, of Windows right now, they've changed something. So all of a sudden, some broke. Um, if I don't have this auditing on, I don't know what happened. I'll have to run it again. Oh, it doesn't work again. Eventually, I'm going to have to go and manually step to it. So getting this, the debug options and the other uh, outputs that, and the like that tell me what's happened, very, very important. And then, a shout out to the whole community. Because he's made this open source, because this is public, a lot of you, a lot of really good forensics people are pounding on it. They're the testers. You know, they're finding bugs that we may miss. A lot of eyes are on these, a lot of suggestions going in. So it's a group, a group sort of effort, and it's, uh, so it makes it quite valuable to me doing forensics. Because if I had to write all this stuff ourselves, it's, it's very difficult to write good tools and keep them up to date. I think I said that. Anyway, so what am I trying to do with this easy triage? Well, the triage, I want to be able to give an instant responder either an automated analytics, you know, reports what's happened, or let them to quickly see what's happened. Basically, I want to know what's run, what's been done, what's been changed. Um, and I want to provide context. The analyst is not replaced. The analyst is the one that makes, what does this mean in, the, in, uh, in that context? So, but I want to simplify the job, give them more information. Uh, and to looking at what to do in this, um, this easy triage, so this gets at that sort of planning stage. Um, I've created these buckets, the artifact buckets or, 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 um, or data buckets, and I've kind of made them very high level as opposed to saying I want, you know, AmCache or, or things like that. And the reason is, is if you're going to do forensics now in Microsoft's cloud, you have to be bilingual. So everyone in my team and the SOC, they all have to start thinking Linux and Windows. So I wanted to have something, uh, basically these buckets that can map to different um, operating systems. So file system, well, it could be Extend4, it could be uh, uh, NTFS, config, could be cron tabs, or it could be registry or things like that. Logs, shell, bash shell, uh, uh, you know, link file. So this map. So I, I now will take this, instead of starting with a, you know, Windows 10 and saying these are all the things I want, I kind of map Windows 10 to this. And I can map um, an Ubuntu or, you know, various Linux things to this or, uh, you know, uh, uh, 2019 server. So anyway, I'm looking at stuff in the file system I want to get. So if, this is all Windows right now um, for the, the, the triage, but I'll pull the NTFS stuff, I'll pull the change journals, the secure stream. Uh, then I'm uh, in the registries, I'm interested in how the system was configured, what's this system supposed to be doing, and I'm also interested in like, you know, what's been changed, especially around the areas of persistence or adding stuff for accounts. Events uh, and telemetry, you know, so, Telemetry is AmCache, AppCompat cache, um, uh, ETL files from different traces, of course, all the event logs, things like that. Shell is all the jump lists, the link files, all that kind of stuff. But there's also areas of the registry and shell overlap. And then finally, file content. The file content here is not so much the stuff you'd read, but what type of file is it? What's its internal metadata? What are its hashes? Uh, is it signed? Does it trigger any antivirus signatures? Does it trigger anything else? And are other types of scanners and things like that? So by content, I mean a lot more than just words you might read. Uh, and then other, that raises the category of you don't know what you have on a system, but if you have SQL, then you want the SQL error logs. If you have uh, any sort of Apache or IS server, then you're going to want the server logs. So uh, anyway, these are my broad buckets. This is what we do with it. So um, the embarrassing thing is, Built the slides a couple weeks ago. We collaborated. He's changed things. I'm going to have to redo all this. But as of today, this is kind of how it works. Um, VG is presented to the parsing uh, VM. VM will copy out certain files. Second round uh, runs a bunch of uh, parsing against these files. Uh, not all the files I copy out are parsed. I'm ambitious. These are a lot of files I want to get parsed, so I pull a lot of stuff out. I also like having files available for uh, the SOC team, if the SOC team looks at something, wants to be able to go to the raw file. So they don't have to download a VHD or do stuff with like that. So we parse the artifacts. After that, I go through a third uh, routine, which is a bunch of volume-related scans or querying of the volume for information. And then we do some prep work. I'm going to do a, a migration or a copying of the cat files from three or four locations on the target drive over into my processing VM, restart the cryptographic services. Now my sick check and antivirus is going to be more accurate. And then um, we'll do some of the stuff like that. And it passes it in the fourth one. The distinguishing feature of the fourth one is it must run a system because Microsoft has done all these things with trusted installer. 
and that sometimes interferes with uh, the ability of tools to reach some of the files. So I, last thing is I run a file uh, scans against all files, and so we're looking at hashes, internal metadata, entropy, uh, file type, extension analysis. Um, we have a cred scanner that's looking for anything that looks like it might be credentials, creds, passwords, or anything, which is both good if we have a compromise uh, VM. We know there's stuff on here that allowed this person to go lateral, so we can quickly then pivot to uh, breach analysis. But it's also there because if you see something like brute forcing, they like to drop their tools on, and our credential scanner picks that up. You know, they've got whole lists of passwords, and it just becomes very obvious right away. So, and this is what it looks like in code. Um, well, my code. Uh, so it's just PowerShell, it's just very basic, but we've got, this, uh, it's like Miyamoto Masashi had the two sword. No, I blind people if I do that, so I'll just go back and forth. But, um, so it's just simple, I, you know, here's one cape command line, it runs, it copies everything out, then I go and I lock it down, make it read-only. Then I go to the second one, and then I'm running my uh, uh, parsing scans. And then, third one, is uh, prep work and some of the volume scanning stuff, and then finally the big long one, the one that takes the longest, is the one that's doing all file scans. So it's just four different cape command lines, and then of course I lock the whole thing down uh, by changing the uh, attributes on the files. We're done. Now, what has changed? What's gonna be different? So what's new on this is uh, ability to do some data deduplication. In my case, what's really interesting that to do with this is to avoid processing the same data streams over and over again, which is what you do if you run anything on a Windows system, because all the Windows binaries are hard-linked. Some are hard-linked many times. So you think you're just, you may think you have 10,000 binaries, but you probably have half that, and you have hard links pointing things all over. Um, now, this is the fun part. This is the genius behind CAPE. It's a big change I'm proposing. It's a big change that requires me to create one new target file that says get everything, and changing uh, these command lines. That's it. And I fundamentally changed how this operates. Um, I might consolidate things to make it even prettier, um, but it becomes very easy to change, extend this. Now, we find new artifacts. Windows comes out with something new. I can just drop this in um, by using, uh, like, the, what do you call them, the global uh, targets, the ones that... The just tar the compound targets. Yeah, the com I use it, you know, just add it to a compound target. I can add and subtract things with a minimal of changing, you know, code and stuff. And so one of the big things about doing stuff in the cloud is oftentimes you make a small change and it reverberates one way or the other on your processing chain. And this way, I can actually add, subtract, change things, and, and confine the, the, the work, the things I need to do to make it uh, function. I don't have to chase a, a back and forth to find regressions and stuff. It, it, just, it just works with a minimum of fuss and change. So. This gives you an idea of the output I have on it. Auto runs, look for certificates and things uh, like that. My file scans, I pull this out. I don't call it uh, program execution. I, I, I don't know who's gonna be reading this in the SOC, and I don't, I don't want them to jump to conclusions on some things, so I just say, you know, these are everything we know about executables. But I've designed this, it all fits into my, uh, my idea how this should work. Uh, plenty of logging, and there's more evidence of logging, so I'm looking in the file system scans, and I, I go through, in addition to doing the uh, the MFT parsing the like, uh, using your MFT parser, but I'll also do uh, various uh, FSUtil. Uh, these are just sort of error checking, make sure everything's working, but I'm also doing getting the debug output files and all of this. So I can always check to see, you know, are we getting something? Any, any errors come up? Uh, how good is this? Um, we can stop them from taking this. Uh, I, this is a mock-up. Rob Lee really didn't log in, um, but you know, I just start putting this together, and what you could do when you start bringing in artifacts from all over the operating link system, you know, the user stuff, the registry stuff, link files, jump lists, uh, the different logs, it's a tremendously rich, the story you get. So I, I cobbled this together just to show um, all the things we found, and I, I, this was one machine, a bunch of activity um, over a month, and I got about 900 and something interesting things uh, dug out by these tools. So this, this is really good stuff. Um, this is also really hard to make, which is why we're trying to do a lot of the automated analytics. So Sveta and I are working on this, but a way of consolidating and organizing all this data in something um, useful to machines and to analysts. So on the one, we take everything we learn about a file, we break things down into primary entities and files and entity, and everything we learn from all our scans about that particular file, 
joins this sort of growing dynamic list of file properties. So anywhere you are in this, you look at the file and we have all the properties, everything we know about that file. Uh, Sveta's idea, and, I, um, and, and it's one we're, we're organizing around, is to take events, like your timeline, we turn them into subject, verb, object type statements. So we go through the various things, what this, you know, this entity did this to that entity, timestamp. Uh, it's a way of organizing this stuff that we can run various analytics around it. So we've actually done sort of what we call our end-to-end -end analytics. We take particular types of cases that are troublesome to CDOC, and we try to come up with the analytics that we run a VHD through, and it will tell us yes or no if we're seeing that kind of activity. And the, the proof of concept when we completed, and she's president, president on, uh, presented on, was uh, uh, ransomware. So we can do ransomware. We never, uh, no one has to even look at the disk. We can tell you when it happened and, uh, and stuff like that. Finally, because we're drawing out these, organ uh, these uh, uh, relationships between uh, the files, we can start doing some sort of graph analysis. So graph analysis. So you can kind of look at everything that this account touched or everything this file did uh, and, and draw this. So it allows then either the uh, SOC people to step through or we can build analytics that are, uh, gather more of the activity. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and the goal with all this is, um, you know, I don't want to replace these guys. That's actually our SOC. Um, everyone is happy there. There's oftentimes they're singing. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's half true. Um, but, you know, the idea is that I, we're not going to replace these guys, but they've got a lot to look at, and it's just growing. I mean, when I joined in 2015, I think we had under um, maybe a dozen data centers. We now have 54 data centers. Where are these data centers? Everywhere, except the moon. We're not there yet. Give us time. But everywhere. Uh, and they just keep going, this is growing. So we have, we have to make it so these guys can go home on the weekends and stuff, and the only way we're gonna do that is being able to build these sort of processing tool chains, uh, an automation, and, um, and the like, and, and even um, instead of, uh, I, for me the real goal is, I don't wanna just give these guys alerts, I wanna give these guys a report, you know, instead of saying, found bad stuff on VM, I'm gonna say, bad stuff on VM, and here's everything we know about it, chronologies and the like allows them to more quickly see the big picture, more quickly handle it, more thoroughly, more consistently handle it, and makes their, their life easy. And that's, yes, that's all I have. Thank you very much. So last thing here, just take a picture of this if you want, uh, write down that URL, get, click it, whatever. That's where you can go submit your idea. You have until the end of the first break, and then I'll take a look at those, and then uh, at some point, Rob or Phil, around the, before the lunch break today, uh, we'll let you know what I picked, and then we'll see how well I do. So with that, Bring Phil back up. Thank, Thank you. you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Mm -hmm.